Actually, it's a perfect time to open up the discussion to the roundtable. Uh, I would like to actually uh, introduce Erin and uh, also the rest of the roundtable. Alex is with us, Six is with us, and um, also uh, Amanda is with us. I think Eugene is also coming. So, uh, Shah, Daniel, feel free to stay and uh, feel free to chime in since you are the uh, ones who have already uh, shared all these analytics and insights. Um, so, hello, Erin, can you hear us? Hi, can folks hear me? Shout it yes, out in the yes, we can, we, can hear you. Great. we can hear you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I first want to shout out Realities. I, I love your story. I, I remember seeing presentations of the stuff that you're working on for so, such a long time. So it's amazing work that you're all doing. And a lot of the content that you've covered are actually some of the initial questions I talked to Farhan about. So um, there's a lot going on in the space. I'm really excited to see so many people here. I just see people shouting out, shout Nicole Lazaro. Uh, Six is a friend. So super excited to be here. Um, I guess we ran a, a bunch of these polls for Han. We're not going to run yeah. them again. Right? We, okay. we have we have uh, really finished the poll, so you will have enough time to talk. Uh, maybe Rahar can share uh, one more time about the uh, sure. Apple Vision Pro course that we are about to release because yeah. so we have actually, maybe I can uh, quickly share uh, the results. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, people are uh, quite... Um, uh, willing to uh, spend, uh, invest, uh, because we ask if uh, when you, in which circumstances will you consider start building for Vision Pro? 46% said as soon as possible. So that's very interesting. 21% said un whenever Unity Pro becomes cheaper. So, uh, and 17% said uh, whenever second, third Vision Pro. Uh, Pro or Apple Vision uh, release happening. That was quite interesting. Uh, our audience is, of course, XR heavy. So um, most of the people said they are either beginning beginner level on Swift or they haven't touched so far. And maybe one more thing that I can share is um, most people are interested in uh, both Reality Kit and Polyspatial Pathway, but Unity Pathway is a little bit higher. So 29% to um, Eleven percent, but most of them. Rest is uh, really uh, would like to welcome both. So what we have he uh, heard or observed so far is um, two pathways is actually um, right now that everyone is planning to explore. But every one of them has some, I would say, limitations or uh, some kind of uh, maybe frictions from a developer side. So let's see uh, how we will. Uh, we will survive as an industry together while building for Vision Pro. And maybe, Rahel, would you like to share the, the upcoming course? And then afterwards, we can leave the stage for the roundtable participants. Bruce. Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Uh, great that we have the roundtable participants complete. Uh, nice to meet you. I will just quickly share my screen. I, um, for everyone who has been here for the previous presentation, don't worry, I won't go through all the slides again. <laughs> um, just the one um, for our poll questions, because it would be amazing to actually, yeah, I mean, just to highlight um, our trainers, our master trainers uh, have published all of these amazing titles. So you may recognize, recognize a lot of them. Uh, so trust our trainers when you're taking our courses. And we have a lot of courses already from rendering optimization to extra foundations, extra prototyping, um, a design fellowship is, which is um, about Apple Vision Pro design a lot um, so feel free to check on our website and um, yeah so and congratulations again to our current Beyond Inclusion cohort uh, we have 50 underrepresented talents who are going to start their XR career in the industry in exactly four months after graduating from our boot camp shout out to everyone here and um, yeah um, what we wanted to ask you all is how is the interest here in an Apple Vision Pro course? So there is two potential pathways we are thinking about publishing and developing a course for. So maybe we could just quickly launch our poll, quest poll question about what people would be interested in learning. Yes, we can, we can release again. Um, in the meantime, just to give everyone a feedback on uh, like the intro, we have two pathways. If you are already a Unity developer, you can follow the Unity pathway. But if you want to learn Swift, uh, which is mostly on the Windows uh, window, uh, side, 
uh, you can go through the Swift rail ticket pathway. So uh, yeah, I mean, in the meantime, let's hand over to Erin and the roundtable. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I hope that this roundtable will continue as a series. Based on the feedback uh, today, I we would really would like to uh, see experts in the upcoming weeks and months. So thank you, Erin, and happy to hand over to you. And stage is yours. For sure. Oh, I see a poll popped up. Are we still? <laughs> I'm running this right. We are going to run this again. Um, since I know some new people just joined, so. I guess if you want to fill out the poll, quick show of hands, what do you need, still need to learn to build vision OS apps? Uh, I was an iOS developer many years ago. I can't vote as a panelist. So folks want to fill that out. Let me see. Go to the next screen. Looks like both pathways is quite interesting for everyone. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. And this is just so that the panelists that are here get a feel for the audience. Um, I know not everyone was able to join for the open lecture this morning. So, you know, there's folks from all over who've been a part of the VR community for a long time. Shout out to David O, Andrea, people from SVVR, Silicon Valley Virtual Reality. I'm just gonna wear my shirt today. I decided to wear this one. <laughs> um, and then there are new folks, a lot of new um, developers in the space and people who've also developed for iOS before. So it's actually important for us to, to kind of see the results here for new folks that have joined. Right, I guess we're gonna run the next couple of polls. And this is just before I run my intros and each of our speakers will introduce themselves. So we got a mix of Swift, a Unity, Polyspatial, both Reality Kit and Polyspatial. Um, I'm jealous of anyone that doesn't need learning materials. I feel like I'm always learning. Great stuff. Perfect. How many folks in this webinar? I think uh, for Han, you said there was like a thousand people registered today. So we have hundreds of people on right now. Yeah, already, exactly. I mean, some people joined to the first one, uh, some people put to vote. So yeah, uh, stage is yours. So uh, we can start from the uh, maybe intros. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to get a baseline for people to have just because the space has changed so much um, in the last, I want to say, five, six years. So first off, I want to thank uh, Farhan and Rahel for organizing the space at XR Bootcamp. I'm so excited and shout out to David O oh for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I know Kent Bai is probably busy and also wrote a praise quote in my book. Most people that know me, I'm Aaron uh, Pangalina and you can find me online at Aaron Jerry. Uh, please buy, if you have not purchased already, the Creating AR VR book. It is in English, uh, Chinese and Korean. It is kind of out of date now because it was published in 2019. And in 2018, we conceptualized this book and I had been rumored yes it is true i said if i tried the apple vision pro i would consider my writing my next book uh it is public now i am writing my next book o'reilly uh wants a, a good proposal that covers apple vision pro many publishers have reached out to me over the years at least two of them to write a new book um that would be updated or just different applications i've said no to everyone um so i'm pretty committed to to this project um before the rest of the folks introduce themselves most people that know me uh, i also previously co-founded uh, arvr academy with liv erickson formerly at microsoft and mozilla and suzanne lee Rick, formerly at Intel and Amazon. Um, we were focused on uh, serving women in underrepresented communities uh, in AR and VR. Super thrilled to be here. I was just telling my co-editor, Steve Lucas, who's at Qualcomm, about you all, and he's He's very familiar with XR Bootcamp, so really great materials um, that people are creating in uh, the education space for our industry that didn't exist when we, you know, had first started ARVR Academy and, you know, spun out that meetup into a nonprofit and, you know, we're early adopters uh, along with a lot of people that have been a part of this community with uh, SVVR, uh, Silicon Valley Virtual Reality as well. Um, I guess I will put in the chat links to the, the book. I, I am going to have an interest form for people who want to uh, say what content they'd like on their next book. And 
a winner from like that raffle, I will give out a free book. Uh, three quick things that were not in that book that I'm considering for the next one are WebXR, blockchain, and 360 degree video, just because these are three things I really wanted in the last one for many reasons, content wise, why people were, felt that wasn't ready uh, to be covered back then. Uh, all of my predictions came true. Bitcoin is now $60,000. WebXR is now a thing with Apple Vision Pro. And now it's like Ready Player One with the Apple Vision Pro. So uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn and socials and all of things. And if you are women working in AR, VR, or AI, I am one of the leads for Women in Machine Learning Data Science, reading a paper reading group on foundation models and things like that. So with that being said, um, and I will not talk very much at this. I know a lot of people want my opinions, but it's really important to hear really established folks in the space who've been a part of this industry building startups for a really long time. I know Six has had so many of them as a serial entrepreneur uh, and as a good friend of mine. So I'm really excited for them to share their stories. Um, so if we can do a round robin of each of our panelists, just say your name, uh, the companies and titles you represent and you know previous apps you've worked on. And the last question I want you to talk about is your first AR or VR experience. So if you can't remember, for me, my first one was Tustany demo on Oculus Rift DK2 and HTC Vive's uh, Tilt Brush. Those were my favorite. And currently I'm working on productivity apps with AI on Apple Vision Pro. It's not announced yet. I'm trying to go across platform. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to Six and you can popcorn the next speaker after that. Oh, okay. <laughs> go straight. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Six. Um, I've worked on uh, what, like, about three different XR companies now. Um, I'm most well known for kind of my initiatives in fitness or sports broadly. Um, the thing that I've worked on that most people probably know about is uh, Live. So if you've ever seen someone inside of Beat Saber and you know the actual game is rendering around them. Um, yeah, that's probably what I'm most known for. I also started a fitness analytics company called Why You Are. Um, it's essentially, we would extrapolate uh, coordinate data and velocity and acceleration movement uh, into fitness metrics. Um, I also did a company that was augmented reality sports. So essentially, what does the sports of the future look like? Um, so yeah, I've experimented a lot in this space. Um, I think the first experience I had with VR... Oh, yeah. And currently I'm building a virtual reality uh, fitness glove and headset. So the headset is uh, about two years away, but uh, we're going to have a glove um, that's designed to allow you to exercise in VR. And we're going to be announcing um, other initiatives to actually be able to exercise in front of your TV as well. Um, so the, the most important experience I think I can say about uh, getting into VR, um, not the first time, but the most important time that really sold me on this, um, is I played Space Pirate Trainer um, in the Vive uh, dev kit. And I've been a huge gamer my entire life. In fact, Six is actually my World of Warcraft avatar name <laughs> um, that I legally changed to. Uh, so I was playing Space Pirate Trainer and I set it up in a, in a uh, co-living space here in San Francisco, about 50 people. And uh, when I was playing that game, there was a moment where the drones come up and it, you know, it, it charges up the laser and shoots at you. And my entire gaming history has always been interactions where there's a juxtaposition between you and the input. So I'd press down on a game pad or something. And so my brain was like trying to analyze how do I respond to this laser that's about to shoot at me? And I got it, which was I can use my physical body. So I did one of these like matrix moves and I like, you know, the laser like shot over my head and I came back and I was like, that's it. That's the future of gaming where we are the controller. Our body is the controller. And I was so fascinated by it, you know, because I had this kind of like deep, connection to the idea of movement and gaming um that it sold me and you know since then i've i've been all in on this uh, on this industry so yeah that's the most important moment for me eugene you want to go next yeah sure happy to um yeah that was uh yeah, first off, happy to be here. Thanks for uh, the invitation. Good to speak to you uh, all via the the interwebs. Um, yeah, I got my start in VR, I guess, uh, over a decade ago. So uh, first thing I saw was my DK1. 
Um, you know, looking at Tuscany, I got very sick, by the way, but uh, I'll get to that later because I'm still I'm still VR sick after being in this industry for as long as I have. Um, but yeah, no, I, going back even before that. So my um, my mom's an accountant and my dad is an opera singer. And that probably explains all the bad decisions I've made in my career in my life, uh, which have all been related to either being analytical, um, you know, you know, technical. Uh, I've been a programmer since I was 15. Uh, but also creative. Uh, so I've been in theater since I was very young. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to do when my dad told me I couldn't sing when I was like three years old. I decided, well, if I can't sing, then I'm going to do at least half of what you do, which is act, right? Because uh, opera singers act and sing. Uh, but, you know, obviously, so I did a lot of theater, um, really fell in love with that. But what I realized over the time is, you know, opera kind of is, I don't want to say it's a dead art form, but it's an art form that isn't like super popular, right? These days, you know, 150 years ago, it was like the pinnacle of all art. You know, you had Wagner, saying this is the, in German, and I don't speak German, so I'm not going to even try to say it, but like, this is the masterwork uh, of, of everything. And, uh, you know, it, it turned out it was at the time, but then it shifted to things called moving pictures in the late 1890s. And I was like, well, these shifts happen. You've had theater for thousands of years. You know, you've had opera for hundreds of years uh, uh, being dominant in our form. And, and now you have this moving picture square, this little square or rectangle moving picture. But what's like the next phase? And I was always obsessed with that idea that you know, every hundred years you get, maybe every few hundred years you get shifts. And now you're seeing big shifts, right? Whether it's AI, whether it's VR, spatial computing. Um, and that's really what got me into it. So, you know, I, I love my DK1, but then I had this opportunity to invest oh, I, on the technical side. I did learn programming, but also was um, an investor for a while. So as a VC, uh, we, though the VC firm was that, I was very lucky and made a lot of great decisions. One of the decisions we didn't make was to invest in Oculus. Uh, even though we had a good in at the time. So we didn't do their Series A. Uh, Spark and Matrix did that my Series A instead. Um, but I voted with my feet. I joined uh, as, uh, you know, as basically director of film and media at Oculus. And I created, I co-created something called Oculus Story Studio while I was there. Hired some of my former colleagues from Pixar, where I did a brief stint there uh, in production. But I got some, some talented people on board and we made some of the first VR stories, right? Things like Henry, which we're lucky to have won an Emmy and some other things. Um, but after... You know, uh, Facebook acquired us, I guess the kids call it Meta now, uh, but, um, you know, I, I left with some veterans from Oculus Story Studio, from Pixar and DreamWorks, I created my own studio called Penrose to write and direct my own films. So my my trade for the last almost decade now has been as a writer and a director. That's what I do. So the uh, the VR apps you that might be known for folks who've been in VR for a while. So the Rose and I was our first film as a Sundance, uh, uh, you know, a Sundance, uh, you know, darling. I, I mean, I, I guess I could say that given that I got a lot of attention there. Uh, Alamet was at Tribeca, the first red carpet world premiere for a VR film. And then um, uh, and then we had Arden's Wake was my latest film. Uh, it starred Alicia Vikander from Ex Machina, Academy Award winning actress, uh, as well as Richard Armitage. Um, and they were fabulous to work with. Uh, and yeah, was lucky it won the first line at, at Venice when they first put Venice, the, the VR in competition, official competition. So that was several years ago. Um, but yeah, I've been doing in the, in the more recent times, been doing, um, you know, more game oriented stuff and uh, just super excited about, you know, this thing to, to finally hit. Well, I was debating with some of the fellow co-panelists. Do I show up as a persona or do I show up as myself? Because uh, I've actually been on persona chats with people here. But yeah, I'm as excited about Vision Pro as I think anyone else in spatial computing. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, so so that's that. Thanks, Eugene. I'm such a huge fan of yours and and also uh, Six. Um, just watching all of your work over the years has always been really inspiring. Uh, next person, they're a little quiet, maybe they can come off of video. Uh, Amanda, who also was at Oculus and was responsible for Oculus Airlink. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Amanda. I'm an engineer. I'm probably best known for um, making Airlink while at, um, you know, Oculus slash Meta. I um, am currently working on a new app for Quest, which is a um, GPL licensed app called Citra VR. It's a 3DS emulator. Uh, I So my background, I spent most of my time in XR working at Oculus slash Facebook slash Meta. I started there in college in 2015. And I worked on a lot of the foundational software for Gear VR, Oculus Go in the original Oculus Quest, and Oculus Link as well. In terms of my, my first VR experience, I guess I've always said like DK1, but technically when I was like 12 years old, I got to tour NASA and I got to go to their VR lab and try one of their VR headsets, which is really cool. And I never talk about that because I thought I was under like an NDA, but it turns out the 12 year olds like aren't beholden to NDAs. So I thought that was really neat. 
Very cool. Interesting. Thanks for sharing, Amanda. And we have our final panelist, um, Alex, who's an architect by trade and is, I, I find all the best people in ARV are not engineers, even though I am also am an engineering computational designer, are actually architects. They design the best. So a uh, privilege to have you in this space. Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Coulomb. I run an XR creative studio in New York City called Agile Lens, uh, immersive design. Been working in VR for a long time, had the DK1 in 2013. Um, as an architect at the time, I'm an architect who also studied a lot of theater in college, something Eugene and I have gotten a bond over. And I immediately started using virtual reality to help pre-visualize the actual theaters we were designing. I got to work on things like uh, the shed at Hudson Yards, a lot of stuff for Lincoln Center, the Park Avenue Armory. And the architecture side of that very quickly um, dovetailed into like, well, let's try to mock up the things on stage. And so over the years, um, Agile Lens was founded around 2015, we started to focus on not just the pre-visualization -visualiz of live performance and architecture that would exist in the real world, but also starting to think about how powerful of an experience you could have um, spatially, I'll just say, because that kind of fits the, the mold for both architecture and live performance entirely virtually. So in 2018, um, a big team of us in New York City had started to play in High Fidelity, which was Philip Rosedale's social VR platform. And then from there started to do more in VR chat and WebXR and Mozilla hubs, and um, now more in Unreal Engine with MetaHumans and all that to really just see how close of a, a powerful, in-person, up-close and virtual experience you can have uh, with a live performer. So every year we've got a production of Christmas Carol. We do live in Unreal Engine and that is you know, accessible from a VR headset or desktop. It's in the Epic Games Store. Um, most of our work has been very enterprise-based. So we gave a big talk at Unreal Fest last year about our work on Four Seasons Lake Austin. Anyone heading to South by Southwest who wants to experience $2 billion worth of real estate in a totally photorealistic VR environment with 5,000 square feet of wireless uh, VR goodness, no backpack, let me know. That's been our, our most challenging and interesting project over the past couple of years. And uh, the first really meaningful VR experience I had would have been at Faneuil Hall in Boston when I was maybe like nine years old. I don't remember much about the headset, except it was very large. There was kind of like a crane thing going on and everything was very yellow and vector-based. And if anyone knows what that experience might have been, let me know, because people ask me this all the time. And it's like, I wish I could tell you the name of what that was. Um, but then I'd say kind of in a similar vein to like what got me most excited about VR and all that, I, I will mention that in 2008, studying abroad in London, both the architecture and theater side of that, and getting to see so many incredible live performances across opera and dance and theater and musicals and everything you could imagine. Uh, I had a professor there who got us into like the front row of every show we saw. And that for me, even though we'd call this more of a, a IRL immersive experience versus VR, was really transformative for me because I realized how incredible and cathartic and world changing uh, a really good live performance can be. So that was 2008. And I was really searching from that point on for any ways that technology could start to democratize that feeling of being very close to a, a live performer. So that's a lot of what we're playing with now, including in the Apple Vision Pro. Great. Oh, and Thanks I teach a lot of Unreal Engine. Sorry, I should mention that. I have the only and the best uh, authorized training center for Unreal Engine in Manhattan. So let me know if you want to learn Unreal Engine sometime. Okay, I'm done talking. <laughs> I love Unreal Engine. Um, I have to say that even though Unity hosted the book launch and you know, Three Heads of Unity were part of my book, um, it, Unreal Engine just owns for anyone that works in the AI space, particularly machine learning and data visualization. That's what my chapter's on in um, the book. Um, that's transformed a lot. And Unreal Engine is actually the better engine for that. <laughs> I hate saying that because Unity is you know, uh, right ones deploy everywhere. Um, but yeah, Unreal Engine is great. So if you are a C++ developer or work on Blueprints, um, use them. They're great. Um, I guess, so my next question for folks is given your past experience um, and sort of the changes that we're looking now with Apple Vision Pro, if you are developing there, you know, one of the biggest changes that you see. So the three distinct ones, and I'll list them in the chat. This actually came from the survey earlier. Um, talk about the challenges here. So are you developing for window, volume, or space, right? These are like the new buzzwords and terms we got, right? So porting your mobile gamer app from iOS, porting your VR game to Apple Vision Pro, volume, or creating a unique AVP for spatial app. So these are for the panelists because we did not get to take the survey. Um, and obviously there's a range. So before folks answer that question, what I will say is, so six is like developing even farther into the future, with like a different controller. So that's 
huge and also really different. Um, you're very active in this space, um, like physically embodied reality. And that's really distinct from Eugene when I'm sort of thinking about like a passive space in AVP. So, you know, you're kind of looking at both MetaQuest, uh, I guess now two, now it's three and pro versus AVP. And if, if since all of us have like developed in that space before and now porting to like something different, I guess for you, what's the biggest challenge in these sort of three categories? Like what's your ideal workflow? Just because a lot of the students that are here, you know, are trying to figure out, you know, the cost, time efficiency that they're investing into developing an app. So kind of what is the pipeline for you of like where you would categorize it? Is it going to be like an AV? P first app, which is what I'm envisioning, although I am doing cross-platform development for MetaQuest 3. And the last thing I'll say with this too is um, I'm partially working on data visualizations. It is very different than Jason Marsh's work because it's actually part of a productivity and planner app. So similar to like Notion and things like that. So I'm completely deconstructing the paradigms of what had been done before. But given that most of you have already been established in the VR space prior you know, now you're kind of thinking about a new workflow, you know, what categories, I guess, would you fall into for any of the apps that you're developing? So this is just a free for all. Anyone can speak. That's a panelist. Uh, well, I, I mean, I can speak real quick. Uh, so the original thing we did was just a window panel. Um, basically, we were just trying to, I mean, in, for the lack of better words, we were trying to prove we weren't full of shit, um, that we could stream real time Bluetooth data to a headset in real time. Um, Realistically, I don't think people are going to be lifting weights staring at a graph. Um, so, you know, it, it was more like, hey, you know, we're building a hardware peripheral. We can actually send the information to a, a Vision Pro. Um, realistically, uh, we don't think the Vision Pro is actually a market for this. Um, it's a cool thing for us to experiment and demo, but, you know, there's so many issues with like, first of all, is anyone going to exercise in a $4,000 headset? No. You know, like I won't, and I do this stuff every day, right? So, you know, I, our addressable market is like 10 people who are crazy. So, you know, like, I think realistically, um, <laughs> I think realistically fitness is not a good use case of Vision Pro. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you've, if you've played Synth Riders and, you know, some of these games, uh, one of the other issues that you have is um, the hand tracking is 30 hertz. So, and then it doesn't have haptics, so you kind of feel a little removed from uh, from the gameplay. Um, so I would I would generally say I don't know I'm probably going to make people mad at this on this panel. If you're building a game, you know I would be careful about building it for the Vision Pro right now, um, just because it's not it's not just um, you know it, it's it's the your your market addressable audience is very small, but controllers are just it's not just the feeling of a controller. And I think people keep saying, well, the world's not going to have controllers or whatever. Um, controllers can update at a significantly faster refresh rate than your hands ever will be. Like, so when you're moving your hands around in synth routers, it's 30 Hertz, right? But in IMU, which is, you know, determining kind of acceleration, that can update up to a thousand times a second. So, this is really important for both games. It's also for like, if your hand goes behind you and you're like kind of waving around, it's super important. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it, hand tracking is very computationally expensive. And I think if you're gonna build a game for the Vision Pro, it should be something like uh, a card game or a table game in my opinion for now, um, just because no one's gonna be exercising in the Vision Pro, so. You know, I, I'm kind of the, the devil's advocate guy for this type of thing, but uh, I would say don't do what I showed, even though it looks cool. So, yeah. So, some folks are writing on the chat. They are appreciating the virtual honesty. Uh, so I think... Oh, you, that's, you that's always get that coming. from me. Yeah. That's also, <laughs> so that's that's also what... why I'm not employable. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what uh, they are coming for, right? So I think uh, thanks for sharing as well. I don't know uh, if maybe Daniel uh, also shared a few things uh, a few minutes ago, but I don't know if he has anything to add. No, I, I think I would even go further. I think Apple designed this headset so to avoid movement. 
it's it's really like the whole the, the paradigm about eye tracking and so on is 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 exactly the opposite like they want you to sit or like stand maybe and and move as little as possible like the whole thing with with the the combination of eye tracking and tapping is that you don't have to stretch your arm out because you you get this uh with like long term if you use the quest long time and you have to like do this all the time like your arms get tired and they they clearly solved for this like this was one of the design priorities if you look at all the stuff that they've done um so yeah i, I think i wouldn't say like it's it, it doesn't work for all games but like definitely like for for the the uh, six for the, the the type of games that you are working on uh, it's it's not a fit and uh, it's a fit for much more casual games much more simple games may i maybe uh, add a follow up question here uh, are you imagining that low energy input games or apps will be really like majority i'm not asking on a specific platform specific but generally I would love to hear uh, anyone your opinion. Like, uh, are we seeing more low energy input because of Apple's push, and it will even affect other headset app stores? I, I think the big killer game in the Vision Pro would be high stakes poker. I mean, everybody with a Vision Pro is going to be super rich, right? So, you know, do high stakes poker with hand tracking. I think that's the the killer game. And face tracking. Yeah. That's the fun thing here. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah God, amazing. I'm a poker player. I, I hated Poker Stars in VR. I've done it a couple of times. It's just it wasn't sticky. For, I'm so picky. <laughs> I prefer to play actually in real life. Um, and online poker that's not in VR. Um, you can though. But anyways, did anyone else want to you know talk about I guess like their prior work and if it's like you're porting it or you're creating something completely new? What's the biggest challenge? You know, in this sort of paradigm shift. So from what did we say it was like window, you know, all these new terms, volume or space. So I guess Eugene, you're doing media and I, that's like a big thing for me. It's like, I feel like I'm diving into like a 360 degree photo and now we're thinking about film. I guess what's the biggest shift for you, you know, in developing, you know, anything that you're seeing with the introduction of new headsets? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And it's one that I think is going to be ongoing probably over years as, you know, great creators develop and create. But Things I've noticed already, uh, well, we've been building for AR Kit, which is sort of the predecessor to Vision OS since 2017 it got, when it got released. So, you know, we were mostly Unreal, a little bit of Unity, but mostly an Unreal shop. Um, and uh, when we ported to HoloLens, we had to do Unity and stuff like that. But um, it's interesting, but then we had to get a bunch of iMacs. Uh, I love Macs myself, but obviously you can't do VR dev very effectively, uh, certainly in 2017 with without PCs. So we got a bunch of, you know, high-end high -end iMacs and started doing AR Kit development. And, uh, you know, we had some some pretty high level meetings with, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say just, well, we had some high level meeting folks with some, some folks who, who knew a lot about uh, ARKit. I'll just leave it at that. But um, what's interesting is we initially ported over, even with that, ported over, we actually have a port of Element and Arden's Wake in ARKit. Um, so it's where you take your phone and you like look at, a ver you know, you look at basically like a thing in your space. Um, and we didn't release it. Because I didn't like it. Like I thought it sucked, to be honest with y'all, right? Like I was like, man, you know, you know, part of it is we don't release stuff that doesn't work. And despite all the work we did, did first off adapt Unreal Engine for which thanks to, you know, I mean nowadays thanks to Fortnite before the lawsuit was uh, was actually working better and better uh, on on Mac and and frankly um, for de for deving on it. But yeah, I mean deving on it of course sucked and it still frankly is not great even though Unreal Engine five three has you know access to I mean you know it's got you got native instead of you know the the, the translation you got a native version. Uh, of the engine, but um, now with, so so basically I'm saying we've been doing this for a while, uh, trying to think of our current apps and then looking at it. And, you know, we, we started Quest Pro. What excited about Quest Pro was the face tracking, right? Like sort of the highest high fidelity face tracking, like eye and mouth, because you can get performers to do, for example, live, you know, live performances, right? I mean, that's something that's exciting to, to, to us. It's like, and we, in 2017, we actually use an AR kit version of Unreal Engine and did a live demo of 20,000 people with an actress behind the scenes at uh, Web Summit, Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and, you know, the audience of 20,000 people ask questions, et cetera. So, you know, I've been fascinated about this for a while. But what's interesting, actually, I find is I thought Quest Pro would be a good dev kit for Apple Vision Pro. But I think I was wrong about that, actually, and I'll tell you why. And also, it's clear to me, and it's been clear to me since Apple Vision Pro's announcement, that Apple Vision Pro itself is a dev kit for Apple Vision Pro 3, probably, right? Which Apple Vision Pro 2 is not going to be out. 2027 at the earliest, right? So, uh, and it's clear to me for all the reasons I think we've all talked about to death, right? It's just such a, I mean, it's too heavy, 620 something grams, way too heavy for a consumer use case. It's got that, you know, it's just, uh, it costs too much, 3,500 bucks, all of those things. Um, 
even if Apple sells out, they can't sell more than what, three, four hundred thousand dollars, three hundred, four hundred thousand units this year of Vision Pro. But um, yeah, so I took my Quest Pro, you know, I was in traveling Europe last year, I had the Quest Pro, I was using it to do like face tracking stuff. And, uh, you know, I just found it like really suboptimal for using it as your screen, right? I did it, did what, you know, face meta told me to do. I like put it on and I use it as a screen. I, I quickly got tired of it, but you know, like this is going to be my second today. I'm flying later and this is my second flight with vision pro. And I can tell you it's way better for that purpose. Still too heavy, still too expensive. But what I find interesting is in vision pro so far, like the VR experiences of which there are not very many, right? I mean, there's synth riders, which is the port and, and, and some other things, but I'm, I mean like the immersive experiences they have, I find them kind of suffocating in vision pro because I like being able to see the pass through and, you know, like the 90 Hertz pass through, et cetera. Um, you know, so I, I don't really like VR. So basically long story short, I completely rethinking. I was like, well, you know, I've been in quest pro. I'm, I'm using my quest pro a lot. You know, this is obviously the, the thing that leads me to know what's going to happen with vision pro, but now I'm a little bit, now I feel differently. Now I think that not only, do we, do I want to build, you know, just, just from a creative standpoint, like native apps and what does that even mean <laughs> for this thing? Um, but it's just going to be a very different kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, I think Arden's wake will play great in here. You know, I mean, this thing, the 4k screens in here, are going to look beautiful in here. And it's, it's a very short process for us to support the ARKit version of here, but I'm like, I don't know. It's, is that, is that what, is that what it is? It might be, it may be, I, I don't know. Like this is all for to say is I have no idea now. Like uh, the vision pros confused me greatly. Uh, especially because I'm using it. You don't like class. VR? What's that? Well, what are you doing? You don't like VR, man? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. Right. Confessions. Me. Yeah. Me. <laughs> I feel like I'd love to watch anything that Eugene and Six create, but in meta AR glasses, because the AVP, it, I thought it would be too big when I tried the demo. It actually is fine. I don't think it's that heavy, right? Because I know everyone talks about weight, but uh, yeah, I honestly, and I will say this publicly here before I, I call on Alex and Amanda to address this question, and then Alex to address some of the questions in the chat on WebXR. I thought I was actually going to give up on AR and VR, and I was going to go full time into AI. I've been in the AI space for a very long time, even preceding um, AR and VR, and that was during the time that I turned down uh, co-founding the Hillary campaign's uh, super PAC as CTO. So <laughs> I ended up choosing AR and VR, and I, you know, uh, went all in with AR VR Academy, even though I cried on election day. Um, what I would just say is like. The introduction of the AVP in this headset, it is game changing. And I thought it's it's personal computing. They've redefined that. And I'm such a loyal iOS dev that for the longest time, most people knew me as like a front end developer. So if you're like new to this space and you're like, ah, oh, it's like really hard to learn all the things, whether it's C Sharp or C++ or is it Swift or which headset? I came in from politics and I had five years of experience. My my former boss, from most people that don't know me, um, was the founder of Tech for Obama and Congressman Rokana, who was the former Deputy U.S. Secretary of Commerce. Um, I didn't formally study computer science. I opted out of the major, even though Asian Filipino parents had said, hey, you should double major in computer science and computational biology and get your PhD at Stanford. That was pre-prescribed for me. And I thought I was going to be an IP and an immigration lawyer. So when I came out uh, in, I want to say 2014 on the campaign, and I was trying to look at startups at the time while I was still doing political fundraising, which is a whole other story. Um, I went to every iOS meetup that I could go to as it was being developed with uh, every VR meetup when it was just starting off and this thing that was taking off called data science. So, you know, I was learning Python and Objective-C before we even have Swift at that time. This is 2013. No, 2013, I was also learning calculus while I was still doing political work. So, you know, I was trying to make a shift and I'm, I'm born and raised in from Silicon Valley. So for all the non-traditional people out here who like didn't go to Stanford or Berkeley or don't have a games background, I didn't. Um, I've had loaded questions always asked to me at a meeting at, at Meta recently, like, do I need to have a games background? You know, like, are you a gamer? Can you be in VR? And I felt like a lot of the times that I was in this space, it was very challenging for me where I was like, well, I dev on front end and I do iOS and I like this thing called data science and AI. And I'd be the weird person talking about crypto, like all of the things that I think are taking off now. Back then, people would just look at me weird, like you don't do VR and game development, like you don't really fit this model. You're an in a wannabe indie gamer, not in AAA games. Like, who are you? Anyone in the startup industry that is coming in now because Apple has opened the floodgates of iOS, it is going to get bigger and huger, right? Like maybe we're not all playing what, what Six is developing now for like a couple of versions, but what I'm envisioning is the next couple of versions of what's to come. So before I... Uh, have Alex and Amanda speak and go off on a huge tangent on AI because I could talk about it forever. Uh, I want Alex to actually address the questions in the chat about WebXR because there was a ton that people were asking and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about 
WebEx are and what that really means. Uh, and as an architect, how you're thinking about, you know, the three different spaces, I'll go back to the question again, just to like anchor us back window volume or space, what are you developing on for AVP, you know, and given prior um, development you've done in VR. So Alex first and then Amanda. Yeah, uh, let me do a bit of a lightning round here. First, piggybacking off um, the excellent points you were just talking about, Aaron. One of my favorite things about the VR community has been uh, how many different backgrounds people have. And you have people who are journalists and tech people and artists, and they're all coming together, which is why it was sad when it felt like AI was kind of stealing the thunder a little bit of, about the potential of XR. And we saw people exiting. We saw, you know, John Carmack go fully from VR to AI. And six, I thought we'd lost six. I thought you were gone forever. And it's so nice to have you back in the, the VR community. For those who don't know, six was doing some really exciting stuff with AI as well, probably still is. Um, for the WebXR stuff in the chat, I uh, just want to point out for anyone who isn't sure, yes, WebXR does work in the Apple Vision Pro. You do need to enable a couple of flags. It's a bit annoying that you have to like go deep into your settings menu to say, yes, yes, yes for Safari. Um, there are some other browsers like Mozilla. Um, I almost said Mozilla Hubs, which is kind of dying. Very sad because that was one of my favorite WebXR uh, social platforms to hang out in. Uh, Mozilla Firefox is also in the Vision Pro. I don't know if WebXR works in there, um, but it will be great when this is just out of the box. The thing I was most surprised by doing WebXR in the Vision Pro is that the hand tracking actually works really well. Most uh, experiences even made years ago that were starting to support hand tracking actually do turn your hands into whatever the hands are in that experience. Um, so definitely play with that. I haven't seen any good um, input being done in Web WebXR yet. It might not even be possible. Um, and as everyone's kind of alluded to, it seems like uh, Apple is really trying to get you to like hold still. So there's not really a lot of like room scale stuff going on where you're encouraged to actually get up and physically um, move around. Uh, very briefly on the question of, you know, windows and volumes and immersive and all that. The thing I was most surprised by with the Apple Vision Pro is that as Eugene was alluding to, I don't find the immersive content nearly as compelling as the windows and the volumes. And what I loved so much about developing for VR was the fact that you could guarantee a captive audience. The fact that in this day and age, when we're all doing a bunch of things on our phone while we're watching TV, while we're having a conversation, I liked the fact that when you make a VR experience, especially something theatrical, uh, the idea that you could kind of force someone to look at that one thing was really special to me. That being said, I really love the ability to kind of multitask in the Apple Vision Pro. So we're actually starting to play with the idea of like theatrical volumes, the idea of like, you can be doing stuff, you've got your windows up, you're working on whatever other things are going on. And maybe there's just this little live performance, these little, you know, dollhouse sized figures that are there on your desk right next to you alongside everything else you're doing. And maybe they don't command your full attention because maybe we're doing some experimental workshop kind of stuff, but you just have these little like, performance captured or volumetrically captured actors just doing a thing right there. And maybe it's a TED talk, maybe it's a, a dance piece, maybe it's a little concert, but the idea of that all living together with everything else you're doing in Apple Vision Pro, uh, we find that surprisingly compelling. Thanks, Alex. Amanda, did you want to add on to this question of like, I know you spent a, a lot of time in, in VR, obviously, because you worked at Oculus, but even just impressions of you know, porting anything over or challenges that you foresee just given, you know, your take of what you're looking at in the market? Sure. I want to go a little bit back to your point for a second about iOS. I, I am curious to know if the frameworks like Swift UI are going to make VR like less intimidating to the non-gaming iOS devs and if that makes a difference in the type of developers we see. I, in terms of the question, I don't know how relevant this is going to be to most people, but I probably can't port my my Citra VR app to Apple Vision Pro because it's licensed under GPL. And not only is the development unlikely to be compliant with that license, the free software license, it also seems that the Apple App Store is a little wary about those types of apps as well. So that's a consideration if you're going sort of the free software route. Um, also, since we were talking about schooling and backgrounds, I actually... Um, um, I also come from a theater background, so it's interesting that a lot of people came that direction. May, may I have follow-up question for uh, for Amanda? Because uh, yes. as far as I uh, follow up uh, your uh, Twitter as well, um, there is a lot of flat to VR interest that you have very uh, naturally that you are coming from Oculus Air uh, also project. So. Um, 
especially, I mean, uh, Alex is with us today, Daniel is with us, who are really, uh, and Shah as well, uh, are really also focusing on Unreal side. And we have seen a couple of like interest towards uh, making a standalone headset, Unreal compatible, even though, uh, even for um, Tethered uh, or Steam VR games. Uh, are we expecting a similar thing for Apple Vision Pro? So Apple Vision Pro become an interesting device for, of course, like the hand tracking, etc., is uh, not easy to implement, but just trying to understand, especially for low input requirement or not so much interaction requirement games uh, or apps. Are you imagining that some Unreal apps at least uh, can be ported to Vision Pro? It's You're asking whether Unreal apps can be, oh, right, with UEVR, I see. Yeah, exactly. Um, with UEVR and flat <laughs> VR, exactly. Well, it's an interesting question. I'm I'm not part of UEVR, so I might you know totally malign them. But my my guess is no, because I believe what they're doing is um, it. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess they're doing it in in, in in yeah. No, I think the problem is that you're you're doing an injection to an existing binary, and that's generally easier to do on a PC. Than it is to do on a on a sort of a closed standalone system. With that said, I could be totally wrong. Okay, uh, Amanda one and maybe, I have... go ahead. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, one one maybe thing that I have uh, seen for the last couple of weeks uh, before Pokemon Go, Niantic brings uh, uh, their uh, title to VR. Actually, uh, Pal World, as you may have heard, this game uh, it's a normal PC game uh, working on Steam. That people start playing Pal World on uh, a Quest headset. That was quite interesting and it took some of the attention. That's why I asked. Alex, would you like to say anything about that? Yeah, uh, just piggybacking off what Amanda was saying. Uh, Amanda and I have, have had some great discussions about the potential of uh, WebXR pixel streaming for Unreal as well. And that would actually piggyback really nicely with things like the UEVR injector, which by the way, you only need for an experience that doesn't have native VR support, but there's already some great demonstrations of native Unreal Engine experiences running in the Apple Vision Pro um, using uh, ALVR, because that's basically just turning your Apple Vision Pro into a, any kind of Steam VR device. Um, so that's moving along really fast. But uh, for those who don't know, WebXR pixel streaming is a way of allowing an Unreal Engine experience to run on a local computer, on the cloud even, and then you're kind of using WebXR as the you know the tunnel through which to funnel that whole experience into a browser, so then you don't even need the app. You open it up in a browser just like any other kind of WebXR experience, but instead of rendering the whole experience locally on device, you're now um, doing it from whatever computer in the cloud or you know in your home that has that Unreal Engine experience running. There are some you know barriers to making that work really smoothly, but it does seem like a very no frills potential future way to get this content onto uh, an Apple Vision Pro without having to deal with all the other hoops that you might have to jump through. I, I want to speak a little bit. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of engineers get really deep into product development, and they don't think how to market their product. And I think that uh, one of the things I want to talk about is the Vision Pro versus the Quest is VR is extremely difficult to market for. And what I mean by that is just like the actual visuals, a first person view of, or a third person view virtual camera of what's happening. The average person doesn't know what the hell is going on. You have either the third person view where the head is like bobbing around and you have hand, you know, it's some type of hand rig moving around, or you have a first person view where it's really shaky and everything. The Vision Pro, um, has a huge edge on marketing. And and uh, the best example I've seen of them uh, communicating this is what I think is the best commercial they've ever had was they have um, the, the uh, you're on a, it, there was an airplane, there's an airplane and they slowly pan down the airplane and there's someone inside, you know, in the Vision Pro and they just expand that window. And then they say something about like your own movie theater anywhere. And I think, I think that's one of the things that I think a lot of people need to think about too, is when you're building a product, how do you market it along the way? Otherwise people are, you know, if you don't, people don't know about something, they're not going to buy it. And this is especially true with games. Um, this is why I spent a lot of time with Liv. Uh, Liv was kind of AR. You could see the person in the game and the context is super, super important when it comes to marketing. So, you know, I, I just want to speak to that, too, because I think a lot of people get so deep in the weeds of engineering, they don't abstract away if that if you're building a consumer application, 
you need to be able to communicate it to the average person of like what's happening and what's going on. And I think AR is much easier. Yeah, uh, Discord is a great uh, way to do that. But AR is much easier way to film and create content. Like if your hands, like puzzling places, if I'm using my hands and I'm creating an object, that's much easier to market than if you had virtual hands moving in there where the average person is like, what the hell are they doing? Right. You, you, they don't get it. We've, um, we've, so seen, I think that's, we've seen our MR like content perform significantly better. Exactly. Like that's, that's, exactly. That's, that's very clear. I love Absolutely. So con saying. Context is, is <laughs> super important. And when right. you're building in, 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 in these ecosystems, if you're building a consumer app, please, for the love of God, remember to like think of marketing while you're building products. Otherwise, Six. no one's going to even know about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I have a question Amanda. about marketing. So one okay. of the things that's interesting about Apple Vision Pro um, and the fact that we're looking at these commercials is I think a lot of other headsets said that like, because you can't really communicate VR or XR without kind of looking dumb in a commercial, a big part of it is going to be people putting it on their heads and trying it out and one of the value yeah. props for a lot of these expensive headsets has always been you know you won't be the one that owns it but your friend will be and they're going to put it on your head you're going to see how great it is and you're going to want to buy it later on apple vision pro can't really do that it's got the you know vision lock and then even in guest mode people are kind of discouraged from giving it to other people because it's often very uncomfortable for oh, their bad. heads they're, so i guess their my, guest mode is yeah. bad yeah yeah so, so i guess my my question is like how is it could that be perceived as like a blunder? What impact do you think that that has? Uh, absolutely. Great question. So I think Palmer Lucky, whether you love him or hate him, he has a great comment that uh, VR needs to be desired before uh, everybody has it. So no matter how the price, I, I botched the quote, but essentially everybody needs to want it before it becomes ubiquitous. And I think Apple's approach of basically hey we're like you know the future is already here but you can't afford it <laughs> it's really like the future is you know the future is here um uh quote uh but yeah i, I think that apple's approach is good in some ways and bad in other ways and some is just like based off the limitations of of design um the fact that they have the headset inside the apple store and it's just sitting there and then people can try it I don't know 100% if that's like, I, I think it's great that people can try the demos, um, but the fact that they have to book it and it's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of friction there, I think is a little bit problematic. Um, but yeah, I, I think that when it comes to actually trying the Vision Pro, it's very un, um, it's not, it's not very easy to, to share the thing. You have to like turn it into guest mode, then you have like 60 seconds to pass it to someone else and they still have to do the whole calibration. Um, and the reason for that is because of the size of the screens that they use, where it has a very small um, uh, sweet spot. And the, the Quest 3, by comparison, has a much larger display. Um, so, th so this is actually uh, one of the design decisions they made that makes it much less shareable, too. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think they've, they've made some good choices. The fact that they have Apple stores everywhere all over the world means that everybody can like try it, uh, whether or not... I didn't actually see a lot of people booking demos, um, which is a little bit problematic. But yeah, I think they, they've done some things right. They've done some things wrong. But the one thing I will say is that these viral videos of people walking around acting like vision bros, um, it did get a lot of attention. So There's you, know, you, didn't, you didn't have people doing I do want to interject and say here. So I love everything Six is saying, but I will disagree with you because uh, we do have some, like Joanna Popper says you can book an AVP demo. Um, I booked one, I think, because I could not go to two conferences. I missed MetaConnect. So I didn't get a Quest demo until recently. And I had to drive to Meta Burlingame store, which is the only store in the world, apparently for Meta. So it's super special. I wish there were Meta stores everywhere the way that Apple has. So I will disagree there. But everything Six said about the marketing um, between AR or VR, it's been so separate for such a long time that, and I was venting to, to Six on Twitter. I was like, when I was in Oculus Launchpad in 2018, and I asked, I think one of the leads for, what is it, Crash uh, Bandicoot that was one of the gaming folks in VR. And he said, what about uh, Magic Leap in AR? What about Enterprise? Uh, Oculus at that time, when it was still called that, right? They were still going through reorgs of names of Facebook, AR, VR. 
they did not really care. <laughs> they, they were like, no, this is so far out. Now, fast forward five years later, and now they're competing with Apple. I take a meeting there confidential. I can't say the client name, but in enterprise, and this is separate from the games industry, in enterprise and in a particular space, so it's like nonprofit education, they are wanting like hundreds of thousands of headsets and they want, you know, a specific demographic, right? So if you're thinking about, are we developing for, for Gen Z or something like that? How many of them get headsets that are playing Beat Saber? Oh, but we want to replace Zoom and FaceTime. So I'm getting everything all over the map where I'm having to make recommendations of, well, maybe AVP is not the right use case. Maybe you really should have Quest, which is cheaper and more accessible. So it's marketed better that way. But people haven't actually tried demos that are making some of these financial decisions for big, you know, organizations that, you know, a lot of people are going to be buying, you know, massive units. And so I think we have to also frame like um, the question when I asked everyone in the beginning, like, what have you developed before in the past? Right. Is it media like Eugene? Are you doing B2C consumer fitness? Are you doing, I think someone asked a question about uh, training fire firemen or fire people, right? <laughs> Firefighters, that's an enterprise use case. And we get questions about training. So know the type of app that you're developing for, and then think about where you are on the map. Like what's your development experience? What's the easiest uh, way and the, the most cost efficient um, to address? I think everything that Amanda said, you know, it's, it, you're right on uh, there on the money. I feel like there's a lot that uh, Meta and Apple are doing differently in, in both areas, but there's so much more to be built. Um, the the chat is going crazy, so I do want some of the other mods to take over there. Yeah, uh, I yeah. We'll take one question that was here, not about business models, but by Nicole Lazaro, who asks about what do the ARVR experiences compare between Quest and AVP? So in parentheses, performance feature experience building for it. So I'm actually going to popcorn back to Amanda, because the question about Oculus Airlink, you were an engineer there, and question of latency was brought up, um, I think, earlier, right? So if it only works really well for AVP, if you combine eye tracking and touch, where for me, I thought I would be doing more with Siri, and Six has said on Twitter, Siri sucks and is not perfect. I tried the Meta Quest 3 recently, and their hand tracking was like not the most perfect to get an AI assistant, but it was the most accurate in speech, right? So how are we also looking at input and given the development of hardware, like what is the better, I guess, like experience that you like, right? Not just you as thinking about the end consumer of whoever is buying your application, but you as a developer looking at performance and, and trade-offs based on these different features and different headsets. So I actually want to go back to Amanda and then anyone else that wants to uh, chime in as well. Amanda? Sure. When I talk to users, users tell me that hand tracking is one of the most accessible. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want to have to pick up a, a gamepad or even your controllers. Me personally, I actually really like the Magic Trackpad on Apple Vision Pro, and that might be because it's a paradigm I'm more used to. Technically speaking, your, your eyes are going to be able to move faster than any mouse will, so it's not going to be the lowest latency thing in the world. But I find it easier for me to navigate personally using some kind of um, touchpad on my palm as opposed to um, hand tracking or eye track, gaze tracking. I, I get a eye strain with the eye tracking. I, I don't know if any like I've never had I've never had um, eye strain before on any VR headset, but when you're like looking at the keyboard and you're kind of like trying to do this and you're like staring at it and going like this, my eyes are whacked out, and I've never had that problem in VR before. Um, yeah, I don't know same. about yeah. you guys. I've never had eye strain like that before. My eyes are like, "What the hell are you doing?" You know? <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not so, sure if part of that is also the screen is really bright by default. That can also be it. But for the first time, my eyes would just dry off. And um, to answer the performance thing, uh, one of the issues that we faced is that it's not clear to us how good Vision Pro is right now. That's not a very easy question to answer. I mean, obviously, it's like a very strong hardware. There's no question there. But our game runs on Quest 1 and runs on Quest 1 really well. So we thought, wow, we could do anything there. And we had performance problems. And uh, because of the way that the render loop is divided between Unity doing its own C++ thing and Apple doing the actual rendering, and uh, uh, the way to diagnose the performance problems being very inadequate right now, it's almost impossible to say why sometimes things lag, sometimes there's weird delays. 
And uh, to go back to your point of AR, AR and marketing, um, one of the bizarre things that I don't really understand is it doesn't seem to me that Apple has optimized too much for capturing pass-through videos. Uh, like pass-through in Apple Vision Pro looks a lot better than Quest, but capture that video, the Quest one looks a lot better on social media. Part of it is tone mapping. Part of it is, I don't know what they do in decoding in, in the meta side in terms of like which camera they actually use and whatnot. Uh, but we really struggled with capturing our marketing material because Apple has a preferred way of doing it for the store. They say do this specific workflow and that lacks. So, um, well, it lacks in game. We actually found out that like because it throttles the the whole like uh, headset down to thirty frames per second, so you have a horrible time being in there playing. But then the footage that comes out actually looks nice. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's all very weird and, and 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 not optimized. You can you can really tell that just some things are 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 not quite ready there yet. Um, Maybe it's I because think of also, the, I think also the thing you can is do not ready, right? Capturing. You know, like my my take on it is that the thing is just not. Good. I mean, I think six referred to, I mean, it's good. Like it's great. It's the best thing we have, I think, you know, my, my opinion, but I think we're just still not ready yet. And I think uh, there was an older Palmer essay, not the recent one where he was on the interview talking about, I mean, he was relatively praising the vision pro, but there's a, uh, an older essay he wrote saying that free is not cheap enough. Meaning like, yeah, you know, we see this over one. and over. Yeah. You had a bunch of CV ones, a lot of things. I mean, sure. But there are VR lovers in this chat. Right. And we need to like look beyond ourselves. Right. And that's what I always tell uh, anyone who I'm co-creating with in, in XR, like, look, we all love XR, but we got to remember that like not a lot of people do. Sure. You got, you know, the people who spend literally thousands of hours in VR chat and they've got, you know, 11 point tracking with their ton of trackers and they've got a 4090 running it, um, you know, so, and they got big screen beyond that only they can wear. Sure. There's those people. And actually that, that number is slightly is growing, you know, by the year and by, by the day, which is interesting, right? The VR chat numbers, steam numbers are pretty open. That doesn't tell the whole story because obviously there's other platforms, but uh, generally speaking, you know, but at this point, you know, you're not gonna get to 100,000 users in VR chat for like years upon years upon years and 100,000 is not a mass consumer market. I, I think with the Vision Pro, I mean, this may be, I mean, this may be controversial. I think we all like it, but I think free is still not enough with the Vision Pro, right? Like, I don't think there are enough good apps. I mean, beyond the limitations of the battery life and the hardware being too, um, you know, being too heavy, like, I'm not really sure, um, I'm really, I'm really not sure that's there. I mean, it's got like the most powerful chip in any. I mean, that M2 has 24 gigs of unified memory uh, shared between the CPU and the GPU. So it's great. I mean, a 4090 has 24 gigs of VRAM. Uh, you know, the M2 chip is powerful. You can run, you know, your M2 MacBook Air. I got one of those. It kind of runs Unreal, right? Um, you know, kind of lowish settings, but that's great. You got the R1 chip doing its thing and then you got the M M2 doing its thing. So like in theory, it should be the best thing ever, but I, I still think we're in a point where it's years away, right? I don't even know if Apple Vision Pro 2 becomes a mass market device, but I do think building now is important, right? Like it clearly before it was like, well, when's that device going to come? So I guess to give a positive spin on it, <laughs> you know, when's that device going to come? And I think now I see that this is blocking and tackling, meaning we block and tackle our way. Yeah, it's, it's not like R&D anymore. Like maybe, you know, Mike A. Brash at Oculus Connect <clears throat> talking about, well, when the optics get smaller, and all this, right? I mean, that's all like really futuristic stuff. But now I see like, well, if Apple can just block and tackle for five plus years, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that mass market device. And not just Apple, I mean, Meta and others, whoever else jumps in the, jumps in the ring, right? But yeah, I mean, I think we just got to recognize, hey, you know, let's talk not to the VR nuts that all of us are, <laughs> lovers that we are. We got to look at the mass market and we're just, we're just far friends. Yeah, um, I, I think... I think by the numbers, well, we have about 200,000 headsets that are sold so far. Um, you know, withstanding the ones that were returned, I think that had a pretty high return rate, unfortunately. Um, I, I think that realistically, if you're building for the Vision Pro, don't expect to make a bunch of money. Just just don't like go go in this like you're going to like college or something like you just started your four year degree at Vision Pro Academy. And by the time you graduate in four years, there'll be a device. And, you know, like this is a long game. If you get in here and you're trying to make quick money, you're going to set yourself up for massive disappointment. Um, but I, I do think Apple is Apple ne almost never gives up on an industry vertical. And that's why this is so important. So there's there's the, the you know, the negative side of the reality is that this is a dev kit. I've, I've said that before it came out. I think it's a dev kit. Um, that's also a really good media consumption device. If you watch movies on this thing, it's, it's incredible if you can get over the, the weight. Those are kind of like the two things, dev kits, media consumption. Um, but really think of it like you're joining the Vision Pro school 
And when you graduate in four years with your master's or something, you'll understand the the, the mechanics, the, the best use cases. And by then a device will come out that will be much more mainstream. And then there'll be a much larger, you know, addressable market for you to work with. So I, I would definitely approach it that way. Otherwise, you, you're kind of going to set yourself up for disappointment. I mean, the best Vision Pro apps will be iPad apps, you know, for context. Like that's not necessarily people, you know, things that people want to hear. But, you know, j just approach this more as like a, I, I think, a college like you're going to that, you know, it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be a big deal. And, and if, yeah, the final point about that. The reason this is so important that the Vision Pro came out is that Apple can't just back out now. So you you guys all heard the news that they canned their their car project, right? So they're they're never going to do that. They're never going to come back and say, "Hey, we're now coming with a car." But the fact that they launched a headset, they are not going to give up to Zucky B. Okay, they're not going to let Zuckerberg take the market here. It's it, the fact that they're launching this thing in its current state with the brick that this is so unlike Apple. Johnny Ive probably had a hot, heart attack when he saw that thing. So the <laughs> fact that they've committed to this this vertical is very, very important because they almost never they're not Google where they come out with something. It doesn't work in three months. They, sh they destroy the whole thing. This is Apple. They commit to an industry for decades once they come in. And so that's why I think it's important to consider this. Like, you're not going to get in here, build for the next four years, and then all of a sudden they're going to pull a stadia. This is going to be big. It's just, <laughs> you know, you're going to have a few more gray hairs by the time that it, that it takes <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, I, mean, I think we've, we've seen the same thing on, on, on the Quest. You know, like we're at 25 million devices now, and it's still like not a huge market. And it, it just takes time. But like you can take this time to learn how that stuff works, and you can build for the audience that is out there. Just make it small games. Make it something that is easy. Make a you know project with like a customer or something. There is ways to like do stuff now. There's ways to to you know keep yourself afloat. There's not a ways to to get rich on the Apple Vision Pro now or something like that. Uh, but there there is stuff that you can do and and just be smart about it and be be realistic about it uh, and. The, yeah, I think as as Eugene put it, like yeah, they don't don't drink too much of of, of your own Kool Aid uh, and and be realistic. And maybe then one, there's always cool stuff you can do. Maybe one one quick follow up about that because since we are comparing Quest and Apple Vision Pro a little bit, let's talk a little bit about the next step or the reaction of other uh, competitors, not only Meta but also Google, etc. I think you have also heard the news that uh, Mark Zuckerberg met with LG today. Uh, to have maybe they are preparing something we don't know if it's for quest 4 or pro uh, so are you expecting a, a, like a, a different drastic moves from not only meta google samsung uh, or uh, any qualcomm or any potential competitor what is your uh, opinion so, since they know that yeah. apple will be there forever so I have a lot to say about this. Before I address that question, we're going to group because there's so many questions in the chat and the Q&A box. So we'll talk about formats. Alex will address that. There'll be more about input. Amanda will address that. And then to reply to Farhan's question. So I was hanging out at a Stanford. Um, Professor Fei-Fei Li, who used to be uh, the head of Google Cloud, um, is now working on a human-centered AI research. So she released her book, got her book signed. Person that sat next to me at dinner is the head of Google, what is it, Design Labs. And I asked him, UX Design. And he said, so, you know, what's happening with AR at, at Google, right? Because they had Google Glass. We all remember glass holes. That was like a failure, right? Um, hardware, you know, folks just got laid off along with even um, people at Google X because Google's had massive layoffs, right? But at the same time, I asked him, I said, so what happened to this one company I saw at SVVR called iFluence? Well, what are you guys building with, with eye tracking, right? I've seen people leave the, what was the Google Daydream team split into games. And then it's like, you know, kind of like what Six said, like Google invested a bunch of stuff, they acquire a bunch of people, and then they kill a bunch of projects. Apple's not like that. Um, what are they talking about? So I asked him, I was like, so what can you say? He's like, I am not allowed to talk about this. So you got to think the things that you're learning now and building a 3D space, whether it's for Apple Vision Pro, that might work in some ways, but not completely in a different paradigm that may be meta AR glasses. And then Google may come out with context. Like maybe that's 10, 20 years in the future. We can't say an exact number, but the fundamentals of like 
3D design development, spatial computing. It's different from web. It's different than mobile. You're involving a little bit more of your body, whether it's full body embodied reality and VR tracking or it's AR or something else. Um, before other people <laughs> reply to that, I just want to make sure because I know we're really short on time. We're about, what, 15 minutes we got left. Um, Alex, can you take on these questions that are talking about either you can write them in the chat or if you see any of them because I don't know which ones you want to answer live. We got a ton about people who can't port. We got substance painter someone else i told them to use git effects there there's a couple um someone that's talking about usd uh and apple vision pro so if you want to address those verbally or written that'd be great and then amanda there are questions i think specific to you as well that we're talking about i think input oh here it was it was a meta neural wristband <laughs> that can be best accessory for apple vision pro so an external hand input devices this can eliminate some cameras on apple vision pro making it small for wearable everyday use so i don't know what we think about with latency there or six because i know you're developing more on fitness but those are the two i guess next big groups of questions outside of like what are our opinions about the, the future headsets and how to develop the the now and whether or not going to make a lot of money or not, but for the future. So yeah, I guess those are the three buckets. So Alex, Amanda, and then everyone else. Yeah, I, I'm trying to answer as many of these in the chat and in the yeah. Q&A box as possible. But briefly, um, USDZ is the file format that Apple Vision Pro likes the most. Um, everyone who has an Apple Vision Pro, check out beautifulthings.xyz. There's an app coming out for it as well, which is this lovely repository of 3D models that you can basically like pull out of your browser and bring into your space. Something I'm really looking forward to with the Vision Pro is proper persistence, where you can actually organize your office and your home and whatever kind of room and have everything you've put there, remember that space and keep it there. I have to believe that's coming soon, just like I have to believe proper occlusion is coming soon, but I'll keep answering questions in the chat. Let's go to Amanda. Sure. So, I mean, a neural wristband sounds cool as hell. I, mean, I don't know. Neural input sounds ideal. I think I could really confidently say that there is a 0% chance that that neural wristband is going to be the lowest latency input mechanism in for the headset i think it is is deeply unlikely that they they release like a first gen neural wristband product and that has um like a, a acceptable amount of latency yeah i, I think one of Amanda, the things we that carm huh? uh no, go for carm oh god I was just going to ask Amanda a question. I was actually just going to ask Amanda, do you think as somebody who worked on, you know, Link, do you think that Control Labs and what it, what it will become, like neural input, is that like the ultimate input device? Uh, or, I mean, what are the privacy concerns for giving your mind to, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, to the mothership that is meta? I mean, what's your opinion on both the feasibility, the usability, but also the privacy concerns? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, certainly um, neural input <clears throat> sounds like it's ideal. And the way I think about it is it's something, it's a way of doing input without having to make any movements. And it might be an easier way to, um, you know, input what I, what I want to do without as much effort. With that said, to your point, we don't know what that looks like as a product. And I don't know if I would want to use a first gen product or not. It just depends on what it would do in terms of privacy implications. I don't know. I think people should talk about privacy implications when we know what the product is instead of going into like sort of a, the sci-fi hypothetical of what neural input could do. I have one other question for Amanda that was in the chat. Uh, Dennis Kerner has been recently hey, experiencing, hey, experimenting hey, can, on Can ABC. I speak real quick? On oh, sorry. Neural. Okay, six. And then we want to, I want to make sure this question gets answered. So good. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, my my co-founder talks all the time about this neural input stuff. And he says, you know, it, it sounds good. It, it, it doesn't work. It's extremely difficult because when you, when you have this on someone's wrist, it's really noisy, the information that you get from it, unless you're like literally connected straight, straight to, you know, the, the actual muscle itself. Um, and this is why after years and years, and years, by the way, Control Labs, which was working on this wristband was acquired, what, five years ago, and they still don't have a product. So like, and, and then <clears throat> recently he's been interviewed saying it's going to be a few years away. So it's one of those things that like sounds good and it might not work because people's muscles are in completely different locations. People's arms, uh, it's, 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 it's still kind of in the hypothetical territory. Um, I just want to yeah, mention that. 
Thanks for sharing that, Six. That's important. Um, one last question for Amanda in the chat. And, and thank you for Alex for answering all the format questions because I did learn CSS in 1994, but WebEx are all the new standards of W3C. There's always new stuff coming out with ARVR. It's a lot to keep track of. Um, Dennis Kunert has been experimenting on AVP recently. So this is for Amanda. Do you think the hands physics lab experience can transfer to AVP flawlessly even with the 30 hertz hand tracking? Or open to anyone else, particularly six, because of everything you're working on in fitness as well. Um, since we're talking about everything from neural wristbands, et cetera. And then from there, I think we, we can go back to Furhan's broader question as well. But yeah, Amanda, if you want to address that. Sure. I think that, you know, anything you want to do gesture wise is probably going to translate. But the, the 30 hertz limit, I think, really does limit its ability to not be frustrating. With that said, the the nice thing is I, I think Apple can improve on that. <clears throat> I yeah, think again, yeah, they, they did a they did an interesting trade-off there. Like it seems that they just take more time for their processing, they do more filtering, and, and then when there's an input, you can be sure that there is an input. And the, the other the other side of that is like you just take more, you know, noisy data, more, more raw data, and you're faster. But they it fits into Apple's design philosophy. Like they, you know, if you make a tap, like they want it to be the tap and uh like not just like yeah kick off like multiple tabs at the same like it's it's, it's always this well, trade-off if you if you work with noisy data so if that's true that's kind of cool because maybe what they'll do instead is they'll have like two modes for it right they'll have like that really nice ux like filtered mode and then they can have like a performance mode that doesn't do all that stuff yeah so i i have a lot of personal experience with this so uh the quest actually had really bad fast twitch movement until uh update 2.1 um, so before then, it, it had a very similar thing where your hands could only, it, you know, no one was basically punching in this thing. So the Quest is now 60 hertz. So it actually has double the refresh. The hand tracking is actually 60 hertz. The, the uh, Vision Pro has 30. Um, so I, I think that Apple hasn't spent a whole lot of time, you know, doing the computer vision for this. Because I, I, I want people to think, like, if you move your hands like this really fast, right? what what is the camera going to see it's going to see basically a blur of what it thinks is a hand right and that has to be intentionally trained on those type of motions and that's very different than like slowly tapping your hand so i mean the short answer to this is don't do fast switch movement with the vision pro right now um and then the final thing i want to mention about that is one of the reasons that the Vision Pro is only running at 30 hertz is they're actually spending a lot more of the uh, compute resources on the hand segmentation. So what I mean by that is like if you crank the thing all the way up to VR mode and you put your hand in that like virtual you know snow or whatever, the the segmentation of your hand is actually much better in the AVP than it is in the Quest. So they're spending much more of the computer vision resources to cut that hand out of the frame. Um, so, you know, they, they've, they've made the decision to focus on basically the things that you do while you're sitting instead of standing. So, by the way, I, I just asked Dennis and Roger, who are the creators of hand physics lab. They are, since they are our trainers, uh, I got the chance to <clears throat> ask them. They are still investigating. Uh, I mean, if there's an interest, of course, maybe in the future, we can create another open lecture round table. Maybe we have actually a follow-up poll that uh, asks if you are interested in series of these events. Uh, maybe we can also release that. Erin, stage is yours. Maybe we can wrap up with last questions. Yeah, um, there was one on digital twins and e-commerce. I'll let people answer that. I can, yeah, someone did answer that in the chat. I had a big question about AI because uh, this is where I, I've been living for like how many years. Um, I'm actually going to put two links into the chat from my friend Devin. Um, so I actually bought the Meta AR glasses. Now, I know this is separate from Apple Vision Pro, but I'm trying to think about like the range of devices and they didn't have an API that I could query to be like, well, I can use um, ChatGPT's Whisper so I can actually talk about, you know, the things that would be equivalent to Siri that I would imagine would be in Quest 3 and Pro. So outside of wit.ai, I thought it'd be working on multimodal models. So this is like for all the people who work in not don't know AI and LP, it's like everything that is going to be like your future chatbot slash whatever your input is for the equivalent of Siri, they didn't have it, right? So what Eugene said which was true, um, free is not enough. And even though Meta's invested in open source 
um, for LLMs and AI free, which is different than closed source for ChatGPT, which that's actually now uh, an Apple Vision Pro app. You know, how are we thinking about AI as it's intersecting with spatial computing, AR, VR, MR, XR, uh, whether it's input, it's more than computer vision and obviously, you know, slam, but just anyone here that has opinions on that, because I think that's actually going to be a big game changer. And what I'm also noticing is like a lot of people mixing between the blockchain space, the AI space, and with AVP, like it's, it's growing and it's starting. Um, not only people creating LLMs that are, sorry, different LLM apps that will completely just change the coding paradigm and make you not be able to learn Swift and you can now create a mobile app. I would love to have that be so easy for AR and VR. It's not there yet, but people are creating like the lightweight APIs and interactions. And what I show, shared in the chat was a dev from Australia who hacked Meta's API to actually create something that they hadn't so that you can utilize voice on AR glasses. So just AI, whether it's speech to text, computer vision, anything, uh, whether it's stuff you see with uh, mid journey, stable diffusion, like what are you seeing merging the most that you think people should learn in their development process that is worth investing their time in? So open question to yeah. anyone here. Yeah, I got I got some perspectives on that. I was actually chatting with Amanda in, in our last Apple Vision Pro chat about, I mean, the question was posed like, what is all this? Why have an M2 chip, right? And I think on-premise compute for AI inferencing is clear. And I guess we'll see what WWDC brings later this year. Um, I think there's a lot of speculation. Apple will, you know, have improvements to Siri, which could, could affect the AVP experience. But, you know, why? Yeah, why have 24 gigs of unified memory now? Of course, Nvidia has like the the stranglehold in the world thanks to its CUDA architecture on you know on just AI in general, right? I mean, they're one of the biggest. I mean, they're now a two trillion dollar company. They're one of the biggest benefits of the AI boom. But even the H100, which Zuck is going to buy, however many, like a bajillion of, I forget exactly how many, but he's going to be couple of so many H100s, the latest NVIDIA card, enterprise level, has 188 gigs of VRAM, right? You can go get a Mac Pro out there. Any consumer can go get something with 192 gigs of RAM, right? Uh, you can spec it out, right? Available to any consumer. Now, that's unified memory, not VRAM, but that's just like a whole ton of, but a lot of people are now, Going off CUDA architecture, there, you know, obviously there's Grok with a Q, G R O K Q, which is trying to create a chipset just for AI inferencing. So, I mean, I think that the 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 possibilities for on-premise AI inferencing on even the Vision Pro, right? I mean, it has plenty. It's, you can do. I mean, you can run a 7D model on an iPhone these days, right? Like a really fast iPhone. Um, I mean, you, you can't run a 70B model even on a on a on a 4090. You have to get a you know enterprise grade. Uh, NVIDIA card. But basically, all I'm saying is I think AI, this AI story is going to be gigantic for spatial computing and not just the whole, you know, obviously, like, obviously, you have computer vision and all of that, which is like a huge part of it. But I'm just saying, like, for consumers, like, AI is not is going to eat a lot of things, but it's going to eat a lot of things uh, from the app side as well uh, for yeah, that, Vision Pro. But in also, the latency, the latency, if it's running on device, will be, uh, you know, essentially you can bring it down to zero. One of the biggest issues that a lot of these LLMs have when you work with like OpenAI is that, you know, it still has to be essentially processed on the cloud and come back to you. Um, and in order for, to, for them to accommodate that, they have to kind of insert the tech equivalent of um. So like they kind of insert words to try to guess what the, the statement's going to be to to infer, to kind of pretend that there's much less latency that there there actually is. Um, but on device LMs, yeah, that definitely agree with that. But I, I do, I do want to mention, uh, a device with 120 gigabytes of Ram, uh, is going to be like $10,000, so, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I do agree. I do agree. The big Ram is going to be important. <clears throat> yeah, maybe, and Alex. maybe. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Oh, just like, what do you think that people should invest learning in, if at all, right, with AI? Um, so I talked about like hmm. voice, speech to text, Got so it. all of the GPTs, all the LLMs, how is that being integrated? How is that changing the the, the UX interaction for uh, users, meaning like developers are creating for that user base? Or how are they utilizing, and I'm seeing, I actually just dropped this in the chat, trace.zip ah. is like eliminating like the ability for people to have to code in Swift, that now they can just focus on coding AI. For AI. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, I get it. Um, if this question truly is open-ended, I think everybody should invest in learning how to build a small neural net that can run on the device, because then you don't have to charge subscription fee for your app. Hardcore. Yeah, I think the the the, the thing to to learn is 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 maybe to also take a step back from all the buzzwords, all the all the uh, you know specs and and all that stuff, and to really. Uh, think about like okay what what do people want to do because the end user does not care about any of the buzzwords they don't care about any of the technology that you use they want to do something and you you have to like sit down and not get like swept away by all the shiny new toys that come out every day and like the pace that that this is going at the moment is so insane it, it, it almost feels like the, like a singularity point um, where if you if you always chase like the newest shiniest toy the newest tech I think you're gonna get lost. Uh, I think it's it's really almost the the time to take a step back and think about oh, what can I build that is cool? What I, can I build that actually creates value? What can I build that like speaks to to like end users or like customers uh, in in the enterprise or whatever, and and to to not get like eaten up by this this deluge of of tech that it's that is that is coming because I think it's just you can you can go crazy. Uh, there and and you will you will just lose yourself also uh, you know like six mentioned it earlier with 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 uh, just marketing like if if you just keep and and even meta has been doing that like they've been like marketing their quest headset like oh it has this specs and it's like that doesn't mean anything for anyone like you have to sell an experience you have to sell a dream you have to sell like a use case uh, and you have to convince people that that is that that is worth uh, uh, you know getting this device for getting your app for not like the the hard specs or the details or all that stuff they, that doesn't matter yeah uh, one uh, anecdote that i think about is um i've had people pitch a million different ideas to me and one of the ideas that i think of that i think is like the best example of what not to do um and i'm probably going to make people upset with this is someone was pitching to me uh, to create like a metaverse Walmart and you could go in there or any retail store, you could go in there and you could pick up like a 3D mesh or something and you can buy it. And I think that, I mean, first of all, it doesn't actually solve a problem because it doesn't make it any faster for you to buy that item. The answer is no, right? So I think that the reality is that when you put on a headset, the user experience has to be 10X what exists in flat screen. So like, can I buy this thing 10 times faster? You know, if I'm creating like, you know, a, a great use case for VR or, you know, he, uh, headsets is a 3D design, right? Is, is the experience worth just abstractly, like take away all the buzzwords, is it worth me putting on a headset, period, right? And for that, you're always going to have friction. So you can't have this like hypothetical you know, we're going to reduce user friction. Just by putting on a headset and using the device in the first place, you are introducing user friction. So that experience that you put on the head has to be 10x what exists in a 2D format. And if it's not, they will not put on the headset and don't waste time with like some hypothetical use cases like in Metaverse Walmart. Absolutely. Well, I think we're at Amen. time right for yeah, I mean, uh, I wish that we can continue a few more hours. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, like all the feedback and uh, even thanks for moderating. Um, it looks Can we get like a picture we've... too before we leave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I've I think seen six in forever. I talk to you on Twitter all the time, but I never get to talk to you. Um, yeah, so just one, two, three, and one more, one, two, and three. Perfect. And for everyone that came today, I put the links in the chat for everyone that wants to contribute to like what content they want to see in the future book that I'm um, trying to finalize a deal with O'Reilly on for creating AR VR. Um, I will pick one person that will get a free one in the choice of your language, English, simplified Chinese and Korean. Uh, thank you for Han. And um, I see that the poll said that we want another yeah. round table in AVP. Exactly. I think it will be a series of uh, a few more round tables. Uh, what we are thinking is to maybe focus on design and also other aspects, the interactions maybe. Uh, so it will be a, even maybe more focused ones. And of course, I would like to also thank to uh, the Realities Puzzling Places team. They have put up an amazing presentation. For those who have registered today, we will uh, actually share this uh, all recording so you can also maybe enjoy i hope it will inspire some people that whenever whenever maybe two three years later whenever we see an amazing avp app uh, they would say this round table and this open lecture inspired me and now i built an amazing app that actually gives 10x more uh, in terms of value 
uh, as six mentioned, I think uh, we are just starting the AVP University or Apple Vision uh, University. Uh, it will take some time, but for those who wants to explore early enough, uh, we are committed as XR Bootcamp, as the community. So thanks for again for joining today. Uh, I hope we will see each other in the upcoming weeks. If you are coming to GDC, South by Southwest, uh, and other events, we will be also there, happy to meet in person as well. And thanks everyone for joining us today for this such a long session. Uh, hope to see you in the following sessions.